Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Junior College Night. Uh, my name is Mark Omni. I'm Director of Advancement, and I'll be moderating the discussion tonight. Um, tonight, we have from the College Counseling Office, Greg Walsh, Mo Kelly-Chesky, Bill Wells, and Director of College Counseling, John Buzang. And I'm going to throw it to John in a minute to introduce our three panelists. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just some housekeeping items at this point. I know all of our students have become pretty familiar with Zoom and probably all of us out there as parents have become pretty familiar with Zoom as well. But for tonight, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, please type your question in the Q&A. Please don't type your question into the chat. Uh, it's easier for us to track those questions in the Q&A section rather than in the chat. And we'll save the chat for information that we want to share with you, whether it's links or email addresses um, to be sent out. Uh, we're going to aim to try to be finished around 745 tonight, but uh, this is a topic that has lots of questions and uh, we want to make sure that we get everybody's questions. This is being recorded, so the College Counseling will have access to this recording and can share it with you um, after the fact if you need it. And uh, any questions that we don't get to tonight, uh, Mr. Buzang and his team will follow up with uh, people individually. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Buzang. Thank you, Mark. As Mr. Imany mentioned, I'm John Buzang, Director of College Counseling, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you uh, for tonight's Junior Night event. On behalf of my WMA colleagues, I'll start by sharing how excited all of us are to begin the college planning journey with each of you juniors and your parents. And on behalf of the entire community, I offer our sincere thanks uh, and heartfelt gratitude to our guest panelists for their time and efforts this evening and throughout the year. We'll begin with introductions of our esteemed admissions officers from Boston College, Brown University, and the University of Massachusetts. Following introductions, each of our guests will provide an overview of the undergraduate admissions process at their respective institutions. And then we'll continue with 30 to 40 minutes or so of questions and answers for the balance of the webinar. As Mr. Imany noted, please feel free to ask any questions during the webinar using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. It's a pleasure to introduce Ms. Erin Ms. Bernard, Associate Director of freshman admissions at UMass Amherst. Erin has worked for the university for 10 years and oversees the entire application and reading process for first year undergraduate admissions. Erin has read applications for the Eisenberg School of Management in addition to other schools within the university, including applications for computer science for the past few cycles. In addition, Erin is responsible for recruiting and high school visits in Hamden and Hampshire counties in Massachusetts. A 2008 graduate of Trinity College where she played women's ice hockey while earning a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, Erin went on to earn her Master's of Education from Springfield College in 2010 and has been head coach of the Smith College women's ice hockey team for the past nine seasons. We're pleased to welcome Mr. Eric DeAngelis from Brown University. Eric began his 17 year admission career at his alma mater, the University of Rhode Island, where he received both his bachelor's and master's degree. He has also worked at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, and currently serves as senior associate director of admissions at Brown University, where he's worked for the past 11 years. Eric's admission work has taken him to nearly all 50 states and 10 plus countries. He estimates he's read more than 25,000 applications in his career and he has presented at regional and national conferences. Eric has been a member of the executive committee of the New England Association for College Admission Counseling for several years and was recently named president elect of NIACAC. We're also excited to welcome Mr. Chris O'Brien who joins us from Ms. Kelly Chesky's alma mater, Boston College. Chris is currently the Associate Director of his undergraduate admission at BC, where he has spent the past 21 years. He also serves as athletic liaison in the office and is, is the advisor to the student admission program 
guiding over 800 student volunteers who give campus tours for BC. Prior to joining the admission team at Boston College, Chris spent two years in admissions at Wentworth Institute of Technology and three years at Fairfield University. He earned his Bachelor of Arts from Holy Cross and his master's degree from UMass Boston. Chris lives in nearby Westfield with his family and is a huge fan of the Boston Bruins and Panera Bread chocolate chip cookies. Aaron, Eric, and Chris will now give an overview of the admission processes at each of their schools, starting with Ms. Aaron Bernard. Aaron? Thanks, John. Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to be here, uh, even if it is virtually. Um, definitely rather be in person. Um, and just a disclaimer, because I am just sitting here, but I'm going to be out of breath when I'm talking, which is embarrassing. But you can't tell that I'm due in a couple weeks. So um, that's why I'm out of breath. I'm not that out of shape that I'm sitting here <laughs> losing my breath. Um, so at UMass Amherst right now, um, we're kind of in the heat of application season. So for seniors, Right now, regular decision, we're reading, trying to get decisions out as much as we can. Um, and so that process is going on. Meanwhile, we're transitioning into talking to juniors, um, which is always exciting. I always feel like that transition in our kind of cyclical admissions process is the most exciting for me. It's, it's a very drastic change and kind of like new faces, new excitement. Um, and so I always really like that that transition and that's kind of where you guys come in. Um, and right now you guys should really be in the exploration phase. Um, so trying to figure out what kind of school you like, you know, generally not necessarily visiting, but visiting virtually schools, um, trying to figure out what school is gonna be the best fit for you. Um, and a lot of schools, all schools I'm sure, um, now have virtual options for you to do that. Um, and you can take advantage of that by maybe visiting some schools virtually that you wouldn't have thought to visit in person because it's too far away or um, you know you just don't get there. You do a, a maybe a Southern trip, but you can't do a, a Western trip or something like that. Um, so really take advantage of that, that you really have kind of the doors pushed open wide for you. And a lot of schools are offering a lot more in-depth programming um, virtually than they maybe would have in person. You know, so for example, you know, departments within the school and college or within the university or college um, might be having some kind of virtual option. Different majors might be having some things. I know we do, um, an example would be, we do like a web spotlight webinar series where we just spotlight a department on campus and every, like four or five times a semester. And um, it's kind of more like a, uh, like a podcast type um, experience where it's just a lot of conversation. It's, it's not super formal. So like, we didn't have anything like that in person before. So definitely there's, there's definitely a lot more to take advantage of, um, but you do have to do your research and make sure that the schools that you're visiting virtually, you kind of pay attention to what they have to offer and that you're getting, choosing the right thing. Um, and if you have questions about that, reach out to the admissions office. They would be more than, more than happy to kind of point you in the right direction. But I would say that's, that's really the, mo the most important thing now. And I know that, that you would like to visit in person and, and some schools, are offering that. Um, but I think that it's okay that you're not. And I, like I said, I think that there's a lot of different options now that you might not have had the opportunity to do if it was just in person. And a lot of schools have virtual tours, like we have a virtual tour um, where we had it before the pandemic, um, where it they sh bring you around campus and there's like peep kind of talking heads giving you the information at different stops. But then we also have a virtual student guided visit where it's tour guides 
live, giving you tour stops that they would have given you in person with pictures, but you get to ask questions live and things like that. Um, so you still get to see campus, even if it's kind of from a virtual perspective. Um, and then, you know, hopefully next year you guys can take advantage of um, of the in-person stuff, visiting the campuses once you've kind of got your list. Um, so once you do have your list, and if we end up on it, which I hope we do, um, the application process for us, how it looks um, is we have two deadlines. We have early action and regular decision. So early action, um, there's early action and early decision and early decision is binding. So if you apply to that school and you get in, you have to go there pretty much. Um, the only usual out is financial, um, but you really should be paying attention to the finances before you apply to an ED school. Um, and we don't have that. We have early action, which is, um, you, it's just an earlier date. So for us, it's November 5th. You apply by November 5th. You usually find out December and January, and you still have till May 1st to make your decision. So you don't have to decide right then that you're coming. Um, May 1st is the national decision deadline. And so you still have time to hear back from other schools, get financial aid packages before making your decision. And then we have regular decision, which is January 15th. And once again, you have till May 1st to make your decision. And you usually hear March, the month of March usually, um, so it's just a kind of a timing thing. Um, there are some nuances to when to apply. And I think that it's becoming, at least at our school, it's becoming more of a decision when to apply. It used to kind of just be, it didn't really matter. The, the benefits were, you find out earlier. And now it really, for our competitive majors, especially, um, I tend to suggest or um, give the advice of apply early if you want a competitive major. Um, it's not always the best choice for everybody. So it's good to talk to your college counselors or me or somebody in the admissions office um, to get a feel. And it, it's not always black and white, but it's, usually we can give you a pretty good, um, pretty good advice. And really the only reason to apply regular would be if you really need those senior year grades um, to boost up your GPA, because you always do want to ha have your best foot forward when you're applying. Um, so we have those two deadlines. I did say competitive majors, and that's also becoming kind of more of a prominent thing in UMass Amherst admissions. Um, the pools are getting more competitive. The competitive majors are getting more popular just nationally. Um, and so it's becoming harder to get in. And that's nursing, computer science, engineering, and business. Um, I would say engineering and business have pretty much leveled off, but computer science just continues to grow um, in interest and in applications and in level of applicants. Um, and it's becoming a very competitive major. So it's, it's kind of good to get on top of that right away and, and talk to your counselors about applying early. Um, but those, those majors, I like to point out because we also, with the competitiveness, has kind of come this nuance of second choice major. Um, and so at UMass, we ask you to pick a first choice and a second choice. And a lot of people assume that if they don't get into their first choice, they're considered for their second choice, which is true, but you're not necessarily given equal consideration as somebody else who put it as their first choice. Um, and so, what major choice at UMass Amherst has also become kind of an important decision for people. And once again, open to discussing that with, with um, applicants. And I think that's one thing to kind of take away from this is that the people in the admissions office, at least it's different than what I thought when I was applying, like they're very open and with you and like willing to help. I think I thought like, oh, that's scary. They have all these secrets to like, how to get into college. Um, and really, they're very, everyone I've met and spoken to, they're, they're always willing to help and they give you some pretty good advice. So um, definitely reach out to them. Um, and so that's kind of like the two things that I feel like after this admission cycle, I always wanna tell people about 
Admission specifically at UMass Amherst is when to apply and major choices and how that's going to affect your decision. And then the last thing I'll kind of point out um, is test optional. So we went test optional this past year and it's a three-year pilot program. So it will be test optional for your class and then the class coming behind you and then they'll reevaluate and decide what to do. Um, it's for all majors. You There's no scholarship indication. So like you are still qualified for any scholarships that we offer. Um, and the, I would say the biggest difference, and I don't know that I spoke to this crew um, last year because we had this before the pandemic, um, but this past year we've kind of, we had this policy of like, just submit them. If they don't help you, we won't use them. And that's the only thing that's changing a little bit going into this next year is that really any piece of your application that you give us is gonna be considered um, for admission. So that's something to keep in mind you know, you take them. If you don't like your scores, don't send them. Um, and if you do, then great, because uh, they can help some people. I always give this example because I think it's a good one. Um, we require our engineering students to have a B or better in all their math classes. But let's say one year you got a C and it was just an off year. And then you took the SATs and you get you know, a 720 on your math section out of 800. I'm way more likely to forgive that C to be like, you can do the work, you're good at math, I'm not worried about it, um, than if I don't have any other information. So it's just something to think about and it can't hurt to take them. Um, and once again, I'm willing, and I'm sure, you know, your counselors are willing to help you figure out if it's the best choice for you to send your scores or not. Um, but those are kind of the three things I wanted to point out that's specific to UMass Amherst admissions. All right, thanks, Aaron. Eric, do you wanna, wanna take over? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't find my, my little mute button down there. Um, again, my name is Eric DeAngelis and I'm from uh, Brown University. And so, um, I, I think that what Aaron said, especially at the beginning in terms of like formulating a list and a, a search and how to get started um, are all really good points and things to take into consideration. And Aaron takes on a, a lot of the brunt of that foundational information since she tends to go first in our group every year. So Aaron, thank you for kind of laying a lot of that groundwork for us. Um, so in terms of our process at Brown, we're also in the middle of our regular decision process. Um, so we're trying to do what many colleges are doing right now, which is manage a lot of volume and increased interest um, with fewer resources and fewer people to do the job. Uh, that's been a struggle for a lot of colleges right now, uh, especially in a pandemic. Most colleges and universities have not been able to hire more readers and people and, 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 and help and, and harder to extend the timeline because of the observance of that, that May 1st decision time. And so what we're trying to do is remain committed to reviewing your application in a holistic way while still being very thoughtful about how we shape our class. And so I mentioned we're in the middle of our regular decision process right now, but we also have an early decision process and we wrap that up uh, just around before the holidays where we welcomed about 800 of our uh, next first year students into our class. And something I think is really great about our process specifically is that you don't apply to a school or college or even a major. You just apply uh, and very much in line with the Brown educational ethos where we encourage you to explore everything before making a firm decision. Um, I mentioned the word holistic and that's a term that you're going to hear a lot in this process. And so I just want to remind you that holistic means that all parts of your application matter from your academic profile to how you present yourself to what your interests, accomplishments, successes are, and so on. And just because you might meet an average academic profile with hitting like a specific GPA or test score, whatever the case might be, it doesn't always necessarily mean that it's an automatic admit. There are a lot of other components that are taken into consideration to do what we call shaping our class and making our community reflective of, of what our priorities are. Uh, you know, at Brown and a lot of other highly selective schools, we don't have cutoffs with GPAs and we don't have a specific number of APs or advanced courses or, or anything we want to, but we, we 
always review you within the context of the school that you go to, the opportunities afforded to you, and the environment that you're coming from. So we don't compare you from school to school. We're looking at you in your context and how well you performed in this context. Um, the other big piece that I've been getting questions about is how is this test optional environment going? So, you know, reviewing apps in a test optional environment for the first time is actually proven to be, I think, less challenging than we thought it was going to be. Um, it's actually allowed us to entertain a lot of applications from areas and students that we typically have not seen in our applicant pool before. And I think that that's really exciting. Um, so we're still focusing our review on a lot of those academic day-to-day -day pieces, such as you know, course selection grades and a lot of those other parts of the application, other highlights of your candidacy. Uh, we are going to be test optional again next year. We made that announcement next week. And I can say that we are truly reading and reviewing without this conjecture of why do you or don't you have a test score. Over the summer, when we were talking about how we were going to move forward in this process, I was one of the people in the room, well, in the Zoom room saying, you know, we cannot sit here and say, well, do we think that they have a test? And what do we think that that score might be? Um, I was worried about that just because we had never done this before in our operation. And it's actually gone really, really well. I think that we've all really seen and observed now the barriers that a lot of students have had to um, not be able to take a test. So from our perspective, um, you know, if you do take a test, it is still your choice whether or not you submit it. That is what test optional means. Um, you know, our process also involves a lot of uncontrollables uh, and priorities. I think we might talk about institutional priorities in a little bit. Uh, and these are things that are out of your control. And those could be the context of the applicant pool, uh, is your candidacy one of many? Are there a lot of students with your same interests or profile? Um, decisions are being made by groups of humans with their own biases and experiences informing their own decisions. Uh, and that's a piece where I sometimes like to say in a highly selective pool, it's not just about you. It's not about you. Um, it's about who else is also in the pool with you. So within your like slice of the pie in your school and in your community, there might be some standout qualities, but those could also possibly exist just across an applicant pool. And so that's why we always stress in a highly selective environment that you could have done all the right things, done great, have left a legacy on your school, been a good person. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always work out. And it's not a referendum on what we think of you. It's really a matter of numbers and a matter of space that's available. And so when you enter into a, a really highly selective process, I would always like you to keep in mind that the decisions that you're going to get are not based upon what we think of you. Uh, it's just a matter of us being able to shape our class and meet our enrollment goals the way that we have to. So I hope that gives you a little bit of information about how we do things at Brown. Okay, I guess I'll follow Mr. Doom and Gloom. Uh, good evening, Titans. It's great to be with you. Uh, I wish I was there with you in person. Um, but I'm close. I'm right down. I'm, I'm right down Route 20. I'm down here in Westfield. And uh, I'm happy to speak with you tonight about the college process. And my colleague from Brown is right. My colleague from UMass is right. Um, and if, by the way, if I start to lose my breath, I don't have the same convenient excuse as Aaron. But let's, let's go back a step. And let's talk about what we have going for us. Like all of you people watching are going to college. It's no question. But I think what, what my colleague from Brown is, is preparing you for is it's like saying that you're a, a football player and your goal isn't to make college. Your goal isn't to make the NFL. Your goal is to play for the Buffalo Bills. Like, like you're, you're, you're not aiming low. You're aiming for the tippy top and you don't know if the Buffalo Bills need your skill set quite yet. So let's take it in smaller doses, right? Let's talk about the fact that you've searched for a school before because no one makes you go to w, uh, WMA. I mean, maybe some of you were, you know, thrown in the trunk and dragged there, but for the most part, you were part of a selection process. You, you toured, you talked to people, you met faculty and staff, you got the fit of the place. And when you when all the uh, applications came through, if you applied to more than one, you kind of said, this is the place. This is the place where I, I can be the best high school me that I can be. Academically, intellectually, 
socially, athletically, you made the decision. And who did you make the decision with? The people that were closest to you, your family, your extended family, friends, maybe former teachers. You got a lot of people who knew you reminding you of what you are to find out what the best choices were and eventually the choice to come to WMA. How is this any different? There are tons of schools out there. There are great ones in Massachusetts, a few good ones in Rhode Island and all over the country. So you've got like the, the world is your oyster here. But sometimes we get really caught up in the most selective places and we don't need to do that. You may find that a school that you really love the vibe and you love the energy and you love the campus. It might be of all the schools admission rates that's on your list. It might be the one that might be the, the highest admission rate, meaning it might be the easiest one to get in. Well, it might make your college process much easier. You know, the Civil War doesn't end differently at a really selective college or university than it does at a place that's not as selective. Calculus is calculus. So I, I think that when you start this process, get US News and we'll report out of your head. Get, get the admission rates that are in single digits out of your head for a second and say, all right, I found WMA of all the other places. Some of them might be more prestigious. I don't believe so, but some of them might be considering themselves more prestigious, but this was the one. So you're just gonna do it again. And you've got to defle deflect all the noise around you. So that's important for you guys to start. And then think about all the great things that happened to you at WMA that's gonna make you a very informed consumer. You're, you're, you've had great teachers and you've had great conversations in the classroom. You've had great attention in the hallways. You've had great peers as classmates. So, so your expectations are high. So you want a really special place. Special places don't always mean the hardest to get into, but a special place. So as my colleagues talked about, you've got to start this search informed by your experience at WMA. You've done the search before, you've done it successfully. So don't think that you're coming into this process overwhelmed. You don't have to be overwhelmed. You've got one good search under your belt. So now you just apply some of those things the next time around and you're gonna be okay. Uh, my colleague is correct in the sense that when you apply to some schools, there's gonna be a lot more applications than there are spaces in the class. And a lot of the decisions that you make get under a, a lot of scrutiny. And I, I don't think that scrutiny is bad. I think if anything we've learned over this past year is to be very purposeful with the decisions that we make and be very reflective. You know, I work at a Jesuit Catholic school and product of a Jesuit Catholic education. I believe in reflection. What have we learned from the decisions we've made? How are we now better informed? How will we make better decisions? And whether that's a sport you play or a club you never went out for or reaching out to a teacher that you never would have in person or you never would have done this, we need to be, be much more intentional with our high school career because things change, things stop, things are interrupted. There's no time to wait in your high school career. Like this is the time to carpe diem. This is the time to do those things that make our high school career successful. Because at the end of the day, whether it's, it's, it's Brown or UMass or BC or someplace else, what we really want is very good high school students. We're not just looking for an amalgamation of statistics, someone who's just filled a bucket of APs. We're looking for students that have been really good high school students. And high school students are engaged and involved and are fun to go to school with and provoke discussions in the classroom. You name it, there's probably a list of 15 things. So what we're looking for isn't just, you know, how many APs we're able to get. We want students that are smart. We want students that are wicked smart but we want students that make the right decisions in their high school career. Because when we're comparing, the first thing we do is compare you with what you could have done. Then we compare you with those others. So you sort of get two scores in, in our process at Boston College. All right, I know everything at WMA. What decisions did you make with your classes, with your clubs, with this, with that? And then once I see how much you ringed out of life at, at WMA, now it can compare you with some kid who went to Deerfield or some kid who went to Williston. How much did they do at their place? And that's how we can help make our decisions. So we have a lot to talk about tonight and why there aren't two or 300 more people on this call, I don't know. 
because there's a lot of little things about this process that I think we can shed some light on. And there, I think there's some answers that you know that you just have to ask yourself those really hard questions about to find out the place, to find out what you wanna highlight, to find out you know, what's in store for you in the college process. I've been fortunate to be at the same place for 22 years. I've seen the admissions process evolve. This evolution this year has been, you know, like a, a lot of things, you know, inevitable. We saw more applications. We saw less people visit. We saw more anxiety because people are, are unsure about what's happening on our campuses because they haven't seen it. They haven't talked to us. We're not trying to be less transparent. We're just trying to deal with the changing times. You're coming along this process at a time when we can be very optimistic about the resumption of life as we know it on our campus and the resumption of life in the application process that we'd like it. Because we've all talked about going through a test optional year. At the end of the day, this class will be a test optional class. And if we really like it, we'll never go back. We'll, the heck with the college board. We'll never go back. So we're very excited to see what the future holds. We've had a lot of applications to read. You can see it in my face, the faces of my colleagues. This has been a trying year just in terms of human power, but we're gonna get through it and we're excited to welcome juniors in the process. We're excited to talk about life in a year and a half when we think that we've, we've uh, perfected what life will be like uh, in a world that we remember on a college campus. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. I'm looking forward to helping a lot of people get going in their college process. Chris, thanks. Eric, thank you. Aaron, thank you. That was uh, really great and informative. Um, just kind of picking up on a theme that you talked about, Chris, and the how kind of this is a bit of an unusual year, and each of you touched on this a little bit. Um, so as juniors begin to move uh, and fully research colleges virtually, do you have specific suggestions about best practices at this early stage? And then what are some of the more effective, engaging, or uh, informative virtual options that you've seen? Why don't we uh, start with Eric and we'll go Eric uh, and then to Chris. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, if, if I heard you correctly, I'm sorry, I got distracted because working at home, I have a dog with separation anxiety issues that keeps nudging at me over here. Um, so virtual op options. The thing is, is that I don't think this is something where one school in particular has like figured this out, has like the magic. This is how we engage students and how we are able to uh, give everyone a perfect sense of student culture, classroom experience, and what it's like to live there. Uh, colleges are thinking on their feet right now. Uh, we get a lot of questions about, well, what do you think will happen in a year or six months? And a lot of the times we're just trying to figure out what we're going to do in the next month if we can get kids to eat in the dining halls on our campus, never mind, you know, how we're going to view the AP exams that you're going to take next year. That's not where we're at. And so I, I think we're doing the best that we can to try to highlight student culture and student experience from student voices. Um, that's something that, that I'm very focused in on doing. I know that we as admission people can talk to you all day long about the, the requirements and the, the, the basics, but really when you get down to it, if schools are offering you those opportunities to get student experience and student voice, I would highly suggest doing it. Um, live interactive webinars are like a great way to do that. Um, virtual tours, also another great way to do that. Um, you know, I know people aren't checking their email. It might be good just to like open it, check the email, see if there's anything interesting in there that maybe you can sign up for. A lot of the times we're just pushing that out. College is going to start texting you now. So I think for you, the challenge is, is kind of what Aaron said before with we're like the big picture, like where do you wanna be in like distilling that down? And I think what we're trying to deal with on the college side is how do we best showcase ourselves to you when you, the class of high school class of 2022, this pandemic has happened in a way where you may very well may not have done any college tours by the time that you submit an application next fall. That, that stinks. You know, so that that's something that we're trying to figure out, and I don't have a perfect answer for that, but um, try to get student voice as best as you possibly can when you're looking at these options that are out there. Again, not sure if that was the exact question I was dealing with the dog situation. Eric, Eric I, th I think uh, Eric is is right. 
However, I, I don't think that the marketplace is going to allow colleges to not let people on their campuses. You know, I, wor I, I work in a city that has about 63 different colleges and universities. Some of them are pretty good. Uh, there are some in Cambridge that are all right. Um, but I, I just think that, you know, if Northeastern's doing tours this summer and Harvard does tours this summer, is Boston College not gonna do tours this summer? I, I feel like, I, I just, I, to because Eric's not wrong. It's not gonna be the sexy, I'm gonna have a wonderful experience and have a really cool iced coffee and get a sweatshirt and take a picture with a security guard like that. I don't think that's gonna happen. That happened for your older brother and older sister two years two years ago. I, I think that sexy dream of a, of a summer visit is, is hard to fathom. But I, I just think that, I, and, and my colleagues can gently push me on this one. I think come April, I think colleges are gonna to push to have limited on-campus things for their admitted students. And then they'll start talking about their juniors in the summer. I've been presented with a plan to have juniors in the summer. I'm no, Massachusetts isn't gonna let us do that under the right, under the thing. But I just think that it, it, it's, it's gonna be coming. It's just, will it come on your timetable to feel good about your list? So, so and if you wanna to go to a red state and check out a college, they're doing tours. You can do it, but you know that that sexy idea of 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 going to a college campus and having this wonderful full visit and oh I just ran into the dean of the of the history department oh I just did that no I even think this summer if you get a, a limited view it's going to be a limited view but still a view and that might be at least a little bit helpful in addition to a suite of virtual programming that every college has now claimed to have perfected, and they have, um, in order to get you up to speed on what the place is about. Aaron, do you have anything you want to add there? Maybe even just to kind of what should what should the juniors be doing right now? Like if if what Chris says is true, they might be able to visit in the summer. What should they do now to kind of get a sense of of those campuses before that point? Yeah, well, now it's it's information gathering to create your list. So then you have a shorter amount of colleges that you really are, are just a more whittled down list of schools you want to visit. Um, and, you know, maybe you've seen some of these schools already with an older sibling or you live near them um, and you've seen the school. So you want to spend your time visiting schools you haven't seen. Um, so right now it's really about gathering information. Do you like the feel of the big school, the small school? Where do you wanna go as far as geographically? Do you know what your major is? Um, do they have things that interest you um, outside of the classroom? And that's one thing that I always like to point out is it's not like high school where you are in class most of the day. Um, you're not in class a lot of the time. And so it's important that a school has things that are going to help you grow outside of the classroom. It still could be academic based. It could be research or um, you know, some kind of academic club, or it could not be. And it's just important. You're gonna grow into this person that's not just a student. Um, and it's important to have things around you that are gonna help you and maybe even push you out of your comfort zone a little bit. So just finding, finding out what a school has to offer and what you're attracted to um, and gathering then a list of schools that you'd be interested in visiting. Thanks, uh, here's a, a great question. I, I know this is on the minds of lots of our kids because um, they're involved in lots of different extracurricular activities. Those those have obviously been curtailed significantly over the last year. And, and how are the three of you dealing with the reality that students' extracurriculars have been cut so dramatically? And how is how is that playing into the admissions process? Um, Aaron, you, where, where do you want to start, and then we can jump around? Yeah. So there's a lot of things that kind of change when we start reading this year. Um, and that's definitely one of the things we spent time on in reader training that we have every year um, is making sure that you're not penalizing a kid who doesn't have as many activities as you're used to them seeing. In this instance, it was, you know, mostly 12th grade um, because 
of that's who was applying this year. In your instance, it'll be 11th and 12th grade. Um, but just making sure that you're not holding that against a student. And for us, I feel like where that really came into play was the honors college um, because we did put a lot of weight on what kind of activities and leadership you're involved in. And you tend to get those roles later in your high school career, um, those leadership roles, or you take on more responsibility in whatever activity it is. Um, and so we've kind of started to lean on some other things like, you know, what are your recommenders saying about you? Um, what kind of impact do you have in the classroom? Chris talked about that a little bit. Um, and so just putting a little bit less weight on how many, and, you know, I used to always talk about passion and commitment or things that we're looking for. And it's just not something that we can judge. And so we've kind of, instead of trying to choose, well, what was, what was, you know, available to you for every single applicant, we've just kind of decided to, to ease back a little bit and just use what we have to make good decisions, but not assume that somebody didn't take advantage of what was offered. Um, that's kind of how we've dealt with it. And that's what we trained our readers to do. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Chris? Um, just real quick. I, I mean, that was great, Aaron. Uh, you know, what, when hard times come, you always see creative people adapting to it. So, so what I've seen are, you know, a student, a, a club that at a, at a school that would visit a local nursing home weekly can't do that. But people at nursing homes need support and service. So the group pivots and does training sessions on Zoom and online opportunities for the residents of the nursing home virtually. Or the theater group that can no longer perform in front of groups of 150 or 250 in the auditorium now pivots to a film club or short, a short movie club or a sketch comedy club and, and now take all their things online. So even in these things where, I mean, I made all the, all the salient points that, you know, if you played football freshman year, sophomore year, and then junior year was a wash, we expect you to play senior year when, when that, like those things are gonna be fine. We're gonna connect those dots. But I also found that when these tough times have come, people have been creative. They've been creative with service. They've been creative with music. They've been creative in a lot of things. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And, and those students that find a way to help continue to find a way to help. And, and certainly students might be a little bit more predisposed to BC that a lot of these students come from places where there are pretty robust service opportunities. WMA is one of them. So we see that people do pivot and, and make it work if they're really passionate about a certain thing. Uh, so sometimes these hard times bring creativity and we've been able to see that. Eric, anything you wanna to add to that topic? I mean, I would largely agree with Aaron and Chris on this. Um, I, I think the only other thing that we, that I've noticed in the conversations that we have had um, is also understanding that this time is not just about us looking at how they've, how you have transformed what you did before into something productive in either a remote or a virtual sense, but also really understanding how this has affected your communities and your home. Um, you know, depending upon the areas of the country. So I read Southern California, and as I'm reading a lot of these applications, I mean, there is some real bad stuff that's happened to a lot of families, uh, whether it's health, financial, jobs, family, whatever the case is. And so when we're also looking at how you have been spending your time or, or what it is you're doing uh, during pandemic, it's also reminding ourselves that uh, this has been a really stinky time. Uh, and there's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened to people as well. So to not feel the pressure that you have to come up, like that you have to come up with something and, and do something in this way, I think remaining positive and, 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 and turning, turning uh, you know, I don't wanna say lemons into lemonade, but, but a lot of the stuff that Chris said, but also know that we, we're always reading to with the eye of understanding and empathy, because this is one of those few circumstances where we are all affected by it every single one of us, um, all to very, very different degrees. And so we're gonna take that into consideration as we're, we're looking at applications as well. Great, thanks. Uh, John, I know you've got some questions that have came in, come in uh, ahead of time. So why don't I throw it over to you and 
you can answer those questions. Before I do, I want to thank Aaron and Eric. I know you guys have gone on and there's been some specific questions that you've typed your answers into. So for everyone out there, juniors, especially if you have specific questions about UMass or Brown or BC, feel free to put that in the Q&A and the panelists can, can type their answer right back directly to you. So thank you both for, for doing that. John, over to you. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we subscribe to on our side of the desk, at least, is a partnership approach that, that involves parents. Um, obviously, you don't want to interview the parent, but in, in, the, in the sense of partnership, what practical advice do you have uh, for parents, how they can best support their, their children as, we, as they start this journey and throughout the process? And uh, Chris, do, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, first, unless you've gone through this process with an older sibling uh, or an older child in the last few years, forget everything you knew from your college admissions process in 1993. Like, like it's a whole new ball game in a lot of regards. And uh, that is only going to get in the way uh, in terms of, of helping. But I, I mean, I, I think you need to be there to listen and help sort out the, the information just because there's so much noise around the process. I can't tell you how many times uh, people tell me about how Boston College admits students before they know that I'm an admissions counselor at Boston College. Um, this is one of those things that a lot of people feel like they get good information from someone they met watching a soccer game on a weekend rather than from us. Um, and, and it's not that we wouldn't tell them the information, it's just cocktail parties and cookouts and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of noise. And, and I think that what would be great for parents would be to filter that noise to let the student really be somewhat alone in the college process, sorting through what are the really good fits for them. You know, why the kid down the street got into the school when you know his grades aren't good, you never know what happens at other schools and you, and you shouldn't be the one that identifies those cases for your, for your child. It's, it's about your child and it's about going through this process, finding these places and, and deflecting a lot of that noise and a lot of the anxiety that is applied from all these outside sources. Let it just be them in the schools and be there for a ride to a college campus when you can. You know, be there for an application fee. Be there if you want, if they want someone to look at their essay. They unlikely will, but be there and let them do it themselves. But never let it get adversarial because once it's adversarial, they'll cut you out and then you'll have no idea what's going on. So if you're listening. You, you can be that support and let them drive the bus. And I think that that would be a much better way to go through the next year. Great, thank you. Uh, Aaron, any thoughts? Yeah, um, one piece of advice I usually have is to have the financial talk what, early in the process. Um, I, you know, applying to, diff that doesn't mean that you know don't apply to schools that have big price tags or things like that don't you don't have to discourage a student from doing that but having the realistic talk of like you know at this school if you don't get a good financial aid package we might not be able to afford to go here or um having a list of schools that uh, a variety as far as um what you can get into is important as well as a school with a variety of financial options. Um, and I think this happened in my family. Um, my brother wanted to go to Penn State. That was his number one. He was kind of, it was kind of a long shot. He got in, they didn't give him anything. And my dad, I mean, he almost lost it because he was so upset. He couldn't, he couldn't afford it. He couldn't go to his number one school. And he wished he had had, they had had that talk beforehand and my brother actually ended up going there and they made it work but um but it's I just I felt like I felt that from my dad like he wished he had kind of thought of having that talk with my brother beforehand um and I think that that's important just for students to know um because you should like all the schools that you apply to and be happy no matter where you go and it's okay to have you know top choices and things like that but um I think finances communicating that ahead of time is important. And one thing to add to that real quick is just that, um, you know, Chris was talking about how, how great is that if, 
your favorite place is actually a place that is easier to get into. And that also, usually if you're one of the higher applicants at those schools, they give you more money too. So like, how great would it be if that school was easy to get into and they gave you the most money? Like that's a win-win. Thanks, Aaron. Eric, do you have anything to add? Okay. Uh, moving on to students, what practical advice would you have for the, for the juniors um, to lessen the stress associated through each phase of the college planning process and to provide context for the ultimate admission decisions? Eric, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, it, it's funny just because I feel like all the advice that we would typically give out before is so different now in this world um, because there are so many unknowns at play. A lot of colleges are, are transforming some of their practices on how they select students. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of stress, I think that we as a world collectively see a little bit of a light on the horizon in terms of the fact that this, this can and will end hopefully within this calendar year, and we can get back to a level where we're able to have some sense of, of, of normalcy. Um, in terms of like reducing stress, I think that you just have to remind yourselves that, you know, you're also in a school and a community that has a lot of resources that many other students in schools don't have the access to. Um, so, you know, take comfort in knowing that you're, you're in good hands from your college counseling team to your teachers that you're gonna get there. You're gonna cross that finish line and you're gonna be solid. And like Chris said before, you're gonna to go to college. You just don't know where exactly that's going to be yet. So keeping that in mind as the kind of the end, I think is helpful just to reassure you that you will end up there. Um, you know, and I don't think that this is a solution but I think it's important to recognize that we all have had things that we've wanted or envisioned going certain ways over the past year and into the next, I think, six months to another year that aren't happening the way that we wanted them. Anything from like, you know, Chris was saying like the summer tours, like that's just not going to be the way that you thought it was going to be. Um, and just know that we're all, we're, we're, we're all kind of dealing with some semblance of that loss. It's, it's, it's a weird thing. So, you know, this process is, is a big thing for you now. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have any, any, any sage advice on how to manage the stress, because I think we collectively also, we are also dealing with it on our end as well. Like, how do we make our process as fair and equitable and in, in, in accessible for you while also managing our own lives in a pandemic? Eric, Chris, uh, anything to add? Yeah, um, one piece of advice that I feel like still applies um, is to, I, I always used to give this at my information sessions is um, to have one night a week be college night and starting soon. And it's kind of the one night that you and your family members or whoever's involved um, talk about college. And you can kind of set yourself little deadlines. Um, and this way, as a student, you don't feel like you're constantly being asked about college. And as a parent, you know you have the attention for at least one night a week um, to kind of get out what you need to get out. Um, and I just feel like the smaller deadlines tend to relieve stress. So it's like, how about by next week, you just have asked your one teacher or two teachers to be your recommenders? How about by, you know, this date, you just have looked at the essay topics on the common application and maybe chose one, um, you know, so like just smaller deadlines, because when it when senior year hits, it's senior year and there's a lot going on and it's exciting um, and it's a lot of lasts for you and early action dates, early decision dates come up pretty quickly. So I think starting now and just kind of getting that under your belt is can relieve some stress. If the worst thing that happens in your life is you get rejected from Brown, like you're gonna be, you're gonna live a fine, no offense to Brown, it could be Boston College, you'll live a fine, fine life. What I could tell all of you guys that are applying to college is the coolest part of this exercise I see because I get all this information about you and it's like your Hall of Fame induction speech. I hear speeches from teachers, speeches from your college counselor, 
a litany of all the things that you've done at school, your own personal speech yourself about things that matter to you or inspired you or adversity that you've overcome. Like some random guy in the basement of someone's house uh, who works at a college knows so much information about you. And that's kind of cool. Like this exercise that you, like for the next few months, you're gonna do all the right things at your school. You're gonna win the respect of your peers, the respect of your teachers. You're gonna perfect your writing. You're gonna get good grades. You're gonna do the best that you can. And how is that such a bad thing? Like that exercise of putting it all together and presenting to you six, eight, 10 colleges, whatever the going rate is, like that exercise is really cool. To have the guts to go up to one of your teachers that may have given you a B plus in pre-calc and saying, you know, I really appreciated the, our work together. Would you endorse my candidacy to college? Like that's a cool adult thing to do. And, and the admissions process allowed you to do it. When do you ever get to make it like a speech that anybody cares about? And, and your essay is like this statement that you get to say whatever you want to a college that means something. Like I, I'm 40 something years old. No one cares about what I write anymore. Like you get to do it. Like, like there's some great things about the application process that you should really embrace. Um, I don't know where you'll end up. And if you don't get into a place, you'll dust yourself off. I think we've all learned that in the past year. You dust yourself off and you wait for the next email to come with your next admission opportunity. It's going to be okay. You're all going to go. And it's gonna be your college counselors and it's gonna be the people that you hold close that are gonna guide you through what are the places that make sense for you? What are the places that are right? They'll take care of that with you. But if the worst thing that happens to you is a rejection, hey, if, if you've got that thin skin, maybe applying to all these colleges isn't gonna be a good thing for you. It's gonna to be tough, but you've got resources, you've got momentum. And if you've got a really good career going at WMA, you're going to get a lot more good news and bad. I know it. Chris, you bring up a great point. I think the, the danger in this college search and planning process is to look at it from a transactional purview. Um, I think that, as you alluded to, the, the life skills and the uh, self-reflection and, and everything that goes along with the WMA journey, that in many respects is far more important than you know, the currency of the transcript. You know, I, uh, like many people, I survived not getting into my early decision college or university. And, and I thank God every day, you know, because it becomes for all of us, it became the fabric of our life, which, which continues, you know, we all keep in touch with the relationships that we developed, uh, not only with students, but professors. I'm getting up there though. So um, I'm, I'm starting not to have too many professors, but. <laughs> and just um, real, real quick, John. Yeah. A lot of people this year took it, used the Black Lives Matter, the George Floyd um, situation, used a lot of this chaos as a way to reflect and write essays for colleges. I know they did it for mine and maybe for both of yours. Mm -hmm. Like that, if they haven't had a voice to talk about that in their school and put it on paper and not have to feel like, what a wonderful exercise that is. So, so you know, I, I just, I, I think that, don't hide this process. Don't be afraid of it. A lot of it is going to be driven by students and, and it's opportunities for students to, to let us know and, and, and say what's on their mind. And I think it's great. I, again, I, I don't have to apply every year. I just read them. So it's different for me, but uh, there's part of it that should be exciting. There's part of it that should be an opportunity to really get their voice heard. Yeah, and ultimately for the, for the juniors, when you do get your admission decisions, uh, just it's not a measure of self-worth or self-value. You know, sometimes the rejection from the college of your choice is the biggest favor you'll ever get in your life. So um, stay lemons out of lemonade and stay positive. So Mark, I think you, uh, you have a question from a, uh, that just came in. Yeah, well, uh, I've got a question uh, about uh, students taking gap years. So there might be more students taking gap years and what is the impact on the pool size? And if that's a concern, how do you address that? Uh, Eric, you're nodding your head. Do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this we got this question ad nauseum. Um, all I would say for like past for the past eight months, and so um, both at my institution, but also when looking at data from many other colleges of all different kind of uh, 
levels within the New England area, people did not go through with the gap years. There, there just wasn't as significant of a gap year uh, uh, population as I think was initially thought to be. So ju just an example, at my institution, we typically will grant around 50 gap years per cohort. We have an incoming freshman class of 1700. So, you know, colleges build these numbers into their plans for how many students they have to admit. There's a whole like numerical side to this, uh, this process called enrollment management. And there are people that get paid a lot more money than we all do to figure out the numbers of enrollment and how many people you need in order to fulfill your classes and beds and tuition and all that. And so our job is to, to, to give them the number. Uh, therefore, we typically do 50, we granted 75 this year. And granted is the key word because you do have to request it. Um, we were a little bit more liberal this year, but we only increased our gap year population by about 2%, but we built that in. And so the students that are applying currently really will have a negligible effect um, there. I do think that media, social media and regular mainstream media have made this to be uh, a thing much larger than it actually is. You have to remember also that there are the far majority of students that were out there taking a gap year really wasn't an option for them. Starting college in some way, shape or form, they had to do it. They had to. There was, there was no way that they were either going to be able to continue to stay home. There was no way that they were going to be able to uh, find something to do, find a job. Like there's just too many variables out there. You're certainly not traveling you know, during, during your gap year at this point. Therefore, many, many more students decided that they needed to. When more colleges later in the summer decided that they would actually have people brought onto their campuses, we also saw a lot of the kids that we granted gap years for say, oh, I changed my mind. Can I come now in the next month? Absolutely, sure, come on down. So I think that initially there was a freak out. I think the media inflated it big time. There's a lot of conspiracy about it out there. Um, but talking from my institution, from many other institutions I've talked to, this is really a negligible concern um, for, for, for everyone. So it's something you shouldn't worry about at this point. Anybody else want to add to that, Aaron, Chris? Go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just saying, you know, the international population for a lot of our schools was very much in flux at the time. People were unable to come into the country. People that were here in boarding school, if they went home, they weren't going to come back. So, so th that made the gap year or some sort of middle ground uh, an appealing decision or option. But, uh, but I think Eric nailed it. I think that was much ado about nothing. Um, and, and the talk that it was going to make this year much more competitive uh, because less spots would be available was just a complete fabrication. So uh, I, again, it never really, it never really materialized. And um, again, I think I'll, I'll, some colleges that had a sizable international population had to find a way to manipulate whether they were going to have in-person or gap year or something like that. But, um, but again, the, the gap year thing just never came to the numbers that we were all convinced by outside forces it was going to be. And the only thing I want to add is that every panel I've been on since the pandemic started, we've asked that question and every college that I've been on with has answered it this way. Um, it's pretty much, I went that their defers um, didn't go up by a significant amount. Um, I think we had, we did have, um, we don't normally let international students defer um, and we did this year. So we did have more international students defer, but overall it was pretty much the exact same. Great, thanks. A uh, question uh, about international students and, and kind of what they can do to kind of distinguish themselves in the, in the pool. I think in, in some cases, especially here at WMA, our international students have, have had a, a, different, a more difficult time with this because they've had to, to be home. Uh, they don't, didn't really, in many cases, have the option of actually coming to campus. What, do you, what advice can you give those international students in this process? Chris, you want to start? 
I've noticed in in letters of recommendation from teachers in this cycle, the special notice that they've given to international students that have taken advantage of office hours and other online opportunities. So the, so if, if that were to be the case for the rest of this year, um, I think those international students that were, were able to maintain connections between teachers are gonna be good assets to them as they go forward in the process, just to account for, hey, if not for this, they would have been much more engaged and they were engaged in the classroom and they took advantage of what was available. So um, it was fun to see that teachers, even just rolling through this, this last cycle, acknowledged almost to a person, those international students at their schools that have stayed engaged. Because in many cases, unless the classes were asynchronous, those students were international, they were taking the classes you know, 12 hours ahead. And that commitment alone is a big one. So I've noticed it in those letters of recommendation and I would assume the faculty at, at, WMI, at WMA would be able to you know, make that a point next year if those are the people that are endorsing these particular international students as applications, applicants. Anybody else wanna add on that? I mean, yeah, I agree with Chris. So I, I read um, many areas of New England. I also read China and so, um, I am reading students who normally would have been at their boarding school in New England, and now they're in you know, Shanghai, for instance, one of the areas I read where, you know, they are at 3 a.m. doing classes, um, and I'm seeing that they just, they're not participating as much in, like, the extracurriculars, the virtual things that they're doing. It's really hard because so many of their friends are and, and maybe some of you are in this position, some of their, all their friends are maybe back at the school and doing things and you're physically not there. And there's like that disconnect from your community and it, that's tough as well. And so I, I'm not trying to like go soft, but under uh, remembering that we understand that it's going to be much harder for you to engage with your school community, especially if you've been distant uh, for X amount of time or still are. I think one of, the, and, and this is something completely out of all of our controls, and I think something that's harder for the international population is dealing with visas, especially coming to the US as well. Uh, we worked tirelessly over the summer and throughout the fall, especially throughout the fall, because our first year students actually started last month in January uh, to get visas through and processed and to get people over here you know, 93% of our freshman class was able to physically get here for the start of their freshman year a few weeks ago. Uh, and that's remarkable, most of the international students as well. So that is, that is going to be something that depending upon how things evolve, um, I think the way that the US government is kind of moving right now, we might, it might be a little bit more friendly for international student visas as well, not a political statement, just a reality. So that's just something to also keep in mind. The only thing I'll add is um, tell us, you know, we don't, if you want advice on kind of how to stand out, resiliency is something that we look for in applicants. And, you know, this year, if you've had a tough situation, let us know. Um, it's something I work, my cousin applied to colleges last year. And my biggest piece of advice for him is like, I know you and I don't, I'm not 100% positive what you're trying to tell me here. So like, don't make the admission counselor guess. Just if something happened, if you're feeling something and you want them to know, you know, I went through this and look at all these great things I'm doing. That's great. Just tell them, make sure you don't leave it out because they can't, we can't always guess what's going on. We, we need to be informed. Great, thanks, great advice. Um, Aaron, there is one question in the Q&A that is specific to UMass asking about the Honors College and the traditional um, application process. So if I could ask you to maybe just type that answer in. Um, John, I know we're running up against time. Um, so maybe one more question from you and that should probably take us close to the end. Right, we, uh, we had a question, how much value added is there in uh, pre-college summer residential programs? Um, uh, destination volunteerism and um, uh, exotic research internships, for example, uh, sustainability internships in Costa Rica. Uh, how much value added do, does each of those areas uh, 
bring to the application. I, I can jump in on this. So, um, you know, I, I'm torn on some of these because I think that you can get some great experiences and there's a lot of value out of it, but I also am, a lot of these become pay for play and what you can get based upon your privilege and what you, what you have afforded to you. And so while I think that there, there's some good in there and you can get great experiences, um, I, I, it's hard for me to give a significant advantage to a student because they did it, especially over a student that probably didn't have the wherewithal knowledge or resources to be able to do something about that. Um, you know, John, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of these exotic research, the Costa Rica thing. My, my former dean uh, used to say that he has seen so many students go and dig holes in Costa Rica that there are no more holes left to dig. They're sending students to go fill them back in. Uh, so, you know, while I respect the, the intention and the organizations and, and the places that do these things, I wanna, you know, think about what's the real value add for you. Are you doing it because you're going to go and affect real change? And there are, there are a lot of things out there where students go and they make a significant impact like mission trips and, you know, still reading students that are, are going to places that have been affected by natural disaster and rebuilding homes. Like that's, that's awesome and incredible. Um, but I'm also saying this to the, the parents and just be wary and, and have these vetted through your college counseling office because there are some programs out there that they're gonna tell you to say, eh, that's probably not the most reputable program. And that might not be a good use of time and resources. Um, when it comes to like college pre-summer programs, um, I think that those can be a great way for you to get a sense of maybe the type of college you wanna to go to, uh, where you physically want to be. If you've done one already, great. Uh, I don't think that they'll probably happening this summer. Um, I can say that I don't believe that the uh, that doing a pre-college program at some schools is going to be a huge advantage. Like at my school, it's not. At some schools, it is. It, they're they're going to give you bonus points for doing that. Uh, so I think it's also good to know and kind of plan those things out. So moral of the story: be judicious about it. Be careful about play pay for play. Have everything vetted through your college office because they'll tell you the real deal. Anybody else? Okay, uh, I believe we had one more that came in, Mark. Um, uh, let's see. There's there's a question about extracurriculars, and and we did we talked a little bit about it, yeah. but um, if there's anything else to add, um, just the the question really revolves around. The, it used to be a great addition to the application. What do you do if it's not there? How do you? What are your suggestions? Is you know, how do you make up for that that used to be on your application and you didn't you didn't have that extra curriculum anymore? So how do you how do you work around it? I, Chris, you spoke at length about it, but maybe a little bit more clarification on that topic. Well, well, I mean, I just number one is I, I do believe that you know st students are, can adapt. You know, I see examples of students. You know, the football season was canceled, so the so a bunch of kids went out for the cross country team. Now you might not think those are applicable, those are those are equal, but you had a bunch of kids that wanted to do something, be part of a team, be part of an athletic, you know, and they and they went there, or people that have been part of service projects, you know, they would have done a mission trip to to the Dominican Republic, but instead they did a food drive or they did a a, a feminine hygiene products drive and they sent it to an uh, you know a, an orphanage to the Dominican Republic. I also look to you guys. I mean, no offense, but I look to the high schools. Like, if if there are things that that you want to have these students engaged, so I defer to you guys in the high school setting to say, all right, we're not being able to do this. That like student government is going to have to do something. All right, there's no prom. Well, what are we going to do? And you need to have buy-in from your community, and you guys have the buy-in. You know, if if a bu if a bunch of kids at Ludlow High School don't want to do it, I get it, but if you guys I mean, to be a part of this community is a privilege. And I was, and, and for the things to happen at, at WMA, you have to wear many hats. You know, the athletes have to be artists and the singers have to write for the, for the uh, yearbook. Like, this is what we do. So I would think this would be your, your community at its best. 
let's engage, let's find ways. And, and yeah, you're going to have to be creative and yeah, it'd be great to see a three sport athlete for four years, but if there are no seasons, what are you going to do in the meantime? You, what you'll see with some kids is it'll, it'll make great suffer. And it'll make everything suffer if, if they're not finding other ways to get involved. So I can't come up with them. Um, really strong communities like WMA are going to find alternative ways of getting students connected. And I would hope students with that energy and time and wanting to be with their friends will find ways to do it. Um, I've seen students have done it thus far. And, and like my colleague from UMass said, we don't knock a kid for not being able to be in the orchestra this year. There was no orchestra this year. We all get it. But you know, if we see that the time that was in the orchestra has morphed into something else, like that's really cool. And I mean, Eric's point is a very good one. There are other things we need to attend to than to go to tennis tryouts, I get it. But if you've got that energy and you've got that motivation and you've got this great community to support you, let's find something else to do. Um, because there are some things that lend itself more to social distancing and lend itself more to, uh, the current climate right now, and we can do those things. And I've seen students do it. And once again, tell us, tell us how you're spending your time. So I read an application the other day where a kid had to go home and pretty much homeschool his brother after school because his mom works and he's a single mom and he had to be there for his brother to, to virtual do virtual school. So like that kid's not doing activities, which is fine. But if he didn't tell us that, I wouldn't know. Um, and I've seen a lot of people do work, kind of, they've filled their time with work, um, which isn't an option for everybody either. But so, you know, like, make, don't leave that stuff out just because you're like, oh, that's not an extracurricular activity. Um, let us know what you're doing with your time. And, and to Chris's point, it might not look like what you wanted it to look like but just let us know. Yeah, I would just wrap up that by saying, you know, I, I read a student that I was fortunate enough to have admitted during early decision who, uh, you know, not a great home life, comes from a lower income background, a house where he shares with extended family and spent five days a week in his car outside Starbucks getting Wi-Fi to be able to do his remote learning. Um, and it, his, his time was really spent sitting in a parking lot. And so hearing that was, was, it was compelling and it, it kind of hits home this pandemic for you. Um, but then also he, uh, he learned Korean by just taking free online courses because it was of interest to him. Uh, he talked about how he finally had the time to, and the ability to like read books that he've always, he's always wanted to read uh, and indulge in documentaries. And he kind of pieced together this nice, image of himself uh, really becoming a much more sophisticated thinker and learner as a result of doing some more independent pieces as well. So I, I think kind of what you're hearing is that there's a whole range of things that you can do to kind of keep yourself going, but it's just finding what's going to work for you based upon your own individual situation. Okay. Well, I just want to wrap it up um, before turning it back over to Mark and just, just thanking you uh, Aaron, Eric, and Chris, um, it's, it's been a very worthwhile event and so informative. And, um, you know, you would, what you three bring to the table just is, uh, is so invaluable uh, to, to all of us. So thank you for your time and for um, and, and all of your input. It's, it, it means a lot. So um, Mark, do you want to, you want to close? Yeah, I, I want to add my thanks to Eric and Aaron and Chris. Thank you so much for for taking the time on a on a Tuesday evening to to share your knowledge with us. And uh, reminded everybody out there that this was recorded, so the College Counseling uh, Office will have access to that, so you can uh, refer to it if you need to. And for any students that weren't able to log in for any kind of technical difficulties, you can get that from them. Um, also, want to thank uh, Greg and Mo and Bill for for being a part of this too. Um, I know uh, we all we all learned a lot. So uh, thanks again for your time. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, Aaron, good luck with the baby. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much and uh, be well and stay safe. Take care. And keep, and keep the questions coming. If uh, please reach out to your college counselor and uh, we will get back to you with answers. So thank you all. Good night, everybody. Good night.